So, as you're all aware, driving without insurance, it's illegal in Ireland, meaning the driver must be caught in the act. MIBI is advocating for a legislative change that require all vehicle owners to maintain insurance at all times, similar to the approach adopted in the UK. To discuss continuous insurance enforcement, we are delighted to have Tina Flowers, Head of Customer Operations at MIB UK. Tina joined the MIB UK in 2013 after serving various senior roles within the UK police. She oversees the Continuous Insurance Enforcement Scheme, focusing on innovating processes and methods to improve road safety in the UK. Welcome, Tina. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me along today. And uh, particularly thank you for the very warm welcome that I've received. Um, it's been really interesting seeing where MIBI are in their journey, um, tackling uninsured driving. Um, a little bit about myself. So as head of, sorry, head of customer operations, and any of you that might be in customer operations, you tend to have an assortment of uh, services and teams that you look after. So one of my teams uh, is the police helpline at the uh, MIB in the UK. So we are there to help the police uh, tackle uninsured driving, and we provide the link between the police and the insurance industry. Um, I have some other teams that deal with service support and data support. They deal a lot with data subject to access requests. And also, I get to look after this, which is continuous insurance enforcement. So not the most catchy title, I will call it CIE going forward. Um, and just to give you a little bit about the background. So in 2003, the insurance industry were really keen to try and do more to tackle uninsured driving. And they were in the areas of detection, enforcement and prevention. Um, detection, so our motor insurance database went live in 2003 and the police had access to that. Um, in 2004, the government commissioned Professor Greenaway uh, to look into how to tackle uninsured driving a little bit more. So uh, in terms of recommendation for enforcement, they were uh, issuing fixed penalty notices at the side of the road and also, we had the power to seize. The police were given the power to seize vehicles in 2005. Mm. Professor Greenaway also recommended that there was prevention from the record, and this is where CIE came about. Um, and this was by linking DVLA data with motor insurance databases. Um, so this recommendation was taken forward, but as with all changes to legislation, it does take a while. Um, so from that point um, up until two th it took until 2009 to uh, get the government to agree to the changes in legislation. And that's when the Motor Insurers Bureau started work on CIE with the DVLA in the UK. It did take a couple of years um, in addition to that uh, for the legislation to come into effect in 2011. And then CIE was launched. Um, in 2011, and I joined just at the time, so I avoided all the hard work that had been done just before um, it had launched, and uh, the first letters in CIE were sent out um, in the May 2011. So just to run through uh, the legal side of things, so our Road Safety Act, Act was changed, and that introduced the offence of keeping a vehicle with, which does not meet insurance requirement. And then this in turn amended our Road Traffic Act and it brought in that offence in section 144A to D as well. So what's included in CIE? So I'll go through the process in more detail shortly, um, but we only include taxed vehicles um, in the CIE process. We also remove some other types of um, vehicle status out of it. So those that are declared off the road, uh, the, that's our statutory off-road notification. Um, anything that's marked as scrapped, exported or stolen, uh, we don't 
include untaxed. We have had discussions with the DVLA in the past, should we have untaxed vehicles? It's quite a big pool of re um, vehicles and maybe not as structured um, as the tax vehicle. So we haven't gone down that path yet, um, but it's not off the table at this stage. Uh, we also exclude crown exempt vehicles because they have their own way to insure vehicles. And also um, Northern Ireland are not part of the CIE process at this stage either. Uh, it will involve some more uh, legislation changes over there to actually bring it in. Um, as I mentioned, I will run through the process, but just to let you know also that CIE um, helps us to identify possible mistypes and duplicates on the database. And every month we send a list out to our members, uh, um, a list of their vehicles that may be affected by that. We do run a separate process for fleet letters, and these are DVLA registered fleets. These are not commercial policies as such, um, um, but that's more of an advisory notice to them. And within the process, we have a repeat offender um, process too. So if anyone has been through, the, through CIE, and has paid a fine or been successfully prosecuted, um, then they'll go straight back into the process, avoiding letters, fixed penalty notices, and they'll go straight to prosecution. So I'll briefly run you through this. Um, this is what happens every month um, from uh, when a vehicle will enter the CIE process. Um, as you can see, it actually goes on for much longer than a month and it just continues to run along uh, in the background. Most vehicles will, will come out uh, within a month, but for those who don't, they'll stay there until there's a resolution at the end. So on day one, DVLA will take a snapshot of their taxed vehicles and then they hold on to that. 30 days later, we take a snapshot of our insurance database, now known as Navigate, um, and but we backdate it to their original date. And the real, uh, reason we leave 30 days is we're allowing policies to be added to the database. Now, typically, our policies go on much faster than 30 days. Um, but where we have commercial policies, um, the insurers are given slightly longer, 14 days to add the policy and up to 21 days to add their vehicles. After that point, after day 30, the DVLA will now compare the data sets. Uh, so they'll have a look through all their tax vehicles and try and find a corresponding record of, from our um, extract that we've sent of the database. Any that they cannot find becomes a candidate pool. So this is the pool that we're gonna start selecting out of and sending them a letter. By day 43, that candidate pool is delivered back to us and we, we do that on a daily basis now. So we then take out a selection. Um, we will check the motor insurance database again, and we'll also send them to the DVLA to make sure nothing has changed their end. Anyone who's now compliant uh, will drop out of the process, and those who are not remain, they'll receive a letter from the Motor Insurers Bureau. And the letter just outlines uh, their obligation as the keeper of a vehicle and what they need to do given their particular circumstances, whether that is around insurance or whether it's a vehicle-related matter and that they need to speak to the DVLA. 28 days after sending the letter, we'll do a further check on the database and DVLA will do a further check their end. Anyone who's still showing as having a tax vehicle with no record of insurance will be sent a fixed penalty notice by the DVLA. The DVLA are the enforcing body in CIE for us. Um, the, those receiving a fixed penalty notice have the opportunity to dispute it uh, or pay it. Um, if they do neither, they'll get a reminder um, and then the DVLA will start prosecution. That can go on for up to six months after the fixed penalty notice was issued. So just to give you a typical month of what happens um, after we've sent a letter. So this, this example is looking at sending 50,000 letters a month. At the moment, we are sending around 75,000, um, but the percentages remain the same. So in this example, where we've sent 50,000 letters, 
um, following sending the letters, and when we do the check 28 days later, 42% are now compliant. So 42% have dropped out because they now have a record of insurance on the motor insurance database. Once sending that file over to the DVLA, a further 22% will drop out because they are also compliant for DVLA reasons. So they've now declared their vehicle off the road, they've uh, marked it as exported, scrapped, etc. So from the original 50,000, that will result in around 18,000 fixed penalty notices being sent by the DVLA. Um, following that, some will drop out. So a further 16% will drop out um, because there is no offence. So they have actually proved they did hold insurance at the time or for other um, reasons such as compassionate reasons or resource and time issues. So uh, essentially 20% of letters that are sent will result in a fixed penalty notice being paid or uh, a vehicle keeper being sex successfully prosecuted. So just uh, to run through some of the benefits, changes and our next steps for CIE. Um, so benefits, it does reduce uninsured driving on the road. We've been doing some comparisons with um, Operation Tutelage, which some of you may be aware, which is a very similar scheme that the police run uh, where they do send out an advisory notice where a vehicle has pinged an AMPR camera. Um, when we did that comparison, we saw that 18% of vehicles that were in tutelage were also written to under uh, CIE. There's also some benefits of data quality. Um, our motor insurance database isn't perfect. It's only as good as the information that's put into it. And often people can um, type their registrations in wrong. Um, you know, the, the, there may be a record there, um, but there may be some information that's incorrect. So this actually draws the attention to the vehicle keeper, who in turn will speak to their insurer. And uh, data, data quality improves not both from not just the insurance side, but also um, from the DVLA side too. Following the launch of CIE, we also uh, remove the need to uh, supply proof of insurance when you tax your vehicle. Um, so up until CIE launched, whenever you taxed your vehicle, you'd have to go along to your post office and provide your certificate of insurance um, or do that online. Um, but with CIE being effective, it's actually removed the need to do that. Um, it clearly assists the police, assists the police with uh, tackling uninsured driving, data quality alone, you know, removing um, the need for police to stop vehicles that are insured uh, is saving their time and they can concentrate on the ones that aren't insured. Um, and there are revenue streams for the government and also uh, for insurers for people taking out um, insurance policies. So CIE is 13 years now. Um, we are keeping an eye on things. We like to refresh things. We've recently revamped our letter. Um, on the next slide, there is just a copy um, of those. Um, we also have uh, introduced a QR code, which is very trendy and very modern. And the QR code will take you to our uh, revamped FAQs on our website, which goes through every possible scenario um, why you may have been written to and what you need to do following receiving a letter. Uh, we were limiting how many letters we send out. We're now actually what we call clear the pot out every month. So we write to as many people as quickly as we can um, just to uh, carry on the education and make sure um, people take action. And we were sending letters out by economy post. It's quite expensive to send letters out by the post in the UK. Um, but we uh, have changed that back to second class posts just so they arrive on the doormats a little earlier. So next steps, we've got big ideas and plans coming up for CIE. We are actually meeting with the DVLA later this month um, to have a workshop with them and look at CIE end to end and give it a good refresh and revitalize. We're talking about a friendly letter. So as I mentioned, we select candidates through the month. Um, but we're thinking about at, right at the beginning of the month when we've got our candidate pool, we'll send a letter out to educate 
to try and remove people out of the process before they get into it. We're also speaking to our DVLA colleagues about the use of email. As I mentioned, postage is expensive. It costs us around 50 pence per letter. And we, when we're talking about 75,000 letters a month, that is quite a cost to the MIB. Uh, we are reviewing the end-to-end -end process. If we were to do it today, would we do it how we've made it? No, probably not. There's a lot of file transfer going on, uh, big files, lots of data, um, and there's much better ways uh, in sharing information. And we'll also be continue to work with our members regarding the quality of the data on our motor insurance database also. Um, I mentioned tutelage. We're going to continue working with tutelage. We've seen that we cross into each other's paths and we want to complement each other. Uh, we want to see what we can do to help tutelage be able to focus on and ensure drivers that are actually out on our roads. Uh, that's all I had for you today. This is um, a copy of our letter. Sorry, it's probably very small and you can't see it. Um, but a copy of our letter that we send out and next to it is a copy of the fixed penalty notice that the DVLA send out to, just for your information. Thank you very much and I will welcome any questions. Yeah, uh, as I said, thank you very much, uh, Tina. Um, so we really appreciate you coming over today. Joining us, um, I suppose at the outset I mentioned it's illegal to drive an uninjured uh, vehicle in Ireland, meaning the driver must be caught in the act. However, um, it's impossible for the Guardi to monitor every road to catch these drivers. So the MIB would support a system linking insurance to ownership rather than its use. Uh, Tina explained that adopting this approach allows for better identification of uninsured uh, vehicles through administrative processes and notices to owners. The Irish Motor Insurance database could be used to cross-check vehicle insurance, uh, follow up with uninsured owners, and help reduce uninsured driving, supplementing the great Garda enforcement in a cost-effective way. So we, we'll open it up for questions now. Hi, I'm just curious, how much is the fixed penalty? And Sorry. how much is the fixed penalty? And is it a real deterrent if, for people whose insurance would be enormous? So that's a very good question. The fixed penalty notice is £100. Um, it actually does reduce to £50. This is one of the things that we will be discussing when we meet with our DVLA colleagues going forward. Um, the obvious cost of insurance, particularly for younger drivers, is much more than that as well. Um, typically, if you're taken through to prosecution, I understand court fines are probably between the 200 and 300 pound mark as well. So yeah, it, it's probably uh, a, something that needs to be looked at now in terms of where we are in, in the cost of insurance. Tina, hi, can I just ask you, how, what reaction did you get from people who collect cars or the clubs and all that about having vehicles that were taxed and then happened to be insured when they wouldn't drive them all? I was just interested to hear. So um, those who don't use their vehicle on the road obviously are encouraged to declare their vehicles off the road. Um, we, we do get a mixture of responses from people like you've mentioned, so they might have a classic car, uh, it might be taxed and they might transport it around on um, a trailer to events and not actually use it on the road as well. Um, but it is, it, there, it's just, it's quite clear. You have a tax vehicle, you go and insure it. Um, if you are not using your vehicle on the road, then you need to declare it off the road. So uh, we, we don't get a huge amount of complaints under CIE, believe it or not. Um, we, uh, we'd, we'd get sort of probably a handful a month in terms of people who um, are not happy with the, that they have to uh, either take out insurance or declare it off the road. Um, we find most people are quite very compliant once they receive the letter. Um. 
Um, <clears throat> Tina, thank you for that. It was really interesting. Um, could you just say a little bit more? You talked about the police sending out letters. Of, it's an AMPR um, ping. Um, is that something that's done routinely, or does it do that for certain operations? Or just could you tell me a bit more about that? So um, the UK police use um, AMPR, as, as you probably know, all over nationally. Um, so Operation Tutelage itself um, is sort of centrally coordinated in Wales. They collect all of the AMPR pings across the uh, forces that are involved across the UK. Um, and they um, then coordinate sending letters out with the relevant forces logos on those to those drivers as well. So, um, but AMPR is widely used across the UK um, police forces in terms of they have access to it uh, within their vehicles. I'm not quite sure of what devices they have. Um, yours looked amazing and like Nick, a little bit jealous of uh, where you are with things as well. So, um, but they um, they also have a link, a lot of have a link in with their PNC bureaus to do those checks. So I'm not quite sure they have that data that your officers have um, straight to hand immediately. Um, but yeah, certainly one thing they need to have a look at. Uh, this is more of a comment than anything else. Um, thanks very much. Uh, I suppose now that we have uh, the IMED in Ireland, it begins to open up other ways of looking at how we deal with uninsured driving. Uh, the Gardaí, with the best will in the world, uh, they can only do so much in terms of um, stopping cars. What's been happening in the UK with um, CIE offers a new way of maybe thinking about how we can use the IMED data, if we can use that to maybe clash it against the data for tax vehicles um, from the Department of Transport. We could maybe look at looking, looking at implementing similar processes and procedures, whereby we could identify vehicles at a very early stage and they may not be insured, and then start contacting uh, owners of vehicles to try and get them to uh, insure their vehicles. For those who've you know, taxed your vehicles recently, um, you've probably seen that the question, a bit like in the UK, they've removed the question now where you, have, you don't, no longer have to put in your insurance details, because the assumption is that that information is available now through the IMED. Um, so it's, it's, it's moving in that direction. But we are conscious, given our experience with IMED, just how long it takes to change legislation. Um, and this is going to need a significant um, legislative change to the, the Road Traffic Act. So it's just something we want to start floating out there um, as a way of maybe really tacking on insurance, but bringing it down um, more in line with some of our, our, our our EU um, countries that we deal with. Thank you, Rob. Um, I think, Tina, thank you very much for that. Thank it's you. been very insightful, and uh, you're doing some really good things in the UK, and hopefully we'll be able to, to work with you and get the you know, great ideas and hopefully implement them in Ireland. So thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.